Now, we're recording this episode before the Perth Test match, but it's an opportunity to go through the life and times of the man who has been for so long the voice of Indian cricket. Harsha, thanks for joining the final word. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, many, many uh, Christmases, many New Year's in, in this country, the millennium. Change 99, 2000, I was here too, Darling Harbour. So, really? so many memories. You, yeah. you were here. I, I was watching the violent femmes in a paddock uh, somewhere <laughs> near Torquay. When I tell that to most people, they say, but uncle, I was three years old or something. So. <laughs> what was the first summer you spent out here? Was it 1991, 92? Yeah, ni- 91. Uh, I remember it with great fondness because from a broadcasting point of view, it just changed my life completely. The reason I have such a such an emotional attachment to this country is every time I came here on my first two or three tours, my life got better in some way or the other. 91, 92, coming here was... I, I came here as wide-eyed, gauche. I didn't know what to expect. I'd done three test matches a bit here, over seven years maybe. Uh, I'd only been abroad once to England before. that, didn't know anything about Australia. Missed a flight because I hadn't got exchange on time. I landed up at, what, 8, 8.30 in the morning for 11 o'clock start at the Gabba. <laughs> so, I mean, everything that could have gone wrong went wrong. But the ABC was just magnificent to me. And I, I, I remember writing in the ABC book, I just got into that box. I met the first few people and I thought, I think I like it here. That sounds very familiar, the ramshackle way you got to the ground. Jeff and I have been in similar circumstances many times in our <laughs> freelance adventure. Times. I mean, you, you are, as well as being... Uh, one of the defining voices of, of cricket broadcasting. You are still a freelancer, aren't you? And, and that goes all the way back to the start when you were here in 91, 92. Paint a picture for us as to the sort of work you were doing to, to pay your yeah. way. Well, freelance in a sense. But I mean, I've got television contracts. I've got digital contracts. But, uh, but yes, I'm not an employee as such. I don't go to work to a television network every day. But when I came here in 91, 92, um, I was being paid to do two newspaper reports every day because an afternoon paper in Mumbai. So I had a lunchtime deadline. So as soon as the last ball was bowled, I'd pull out, oh, well, I started before, actually, pull out the manual typewriter and go clattering away at it. (laughs) And if the ribbon got old, you wanted to protect the ribbon for a little while. So you put a carbon paper Uh so that it became darker at the back. But then Mm. you were spending more on the paper. And then you had to find a fax. Fax had just arrived. Whoa. Can you imagine? Fax had just arrived. The new technology. Find a fax. So I, yep. at, at the Gabba, I'd go running out of the Gabba, go to the first signal, turn right. There was a Queensland motel over there. Uh, I think it might have been at the Walter Street end. And there was a Sri Lankan who ran it then. He would fax it for me and charge me only the cost of the, of, of the telephone line. <laughs> and then come running back, do the radio stints. And then go back and do an, a, a close of play report. Then one at the end of the week for, the, uh, for a magazine, which would get translated into Marathi and go into a Marathi magazine. And then uh, we had, you're going to laugh at this. Nobody even knows they existed. We had video magazines in those days because 91 was still only one state-run television channel. We didn't have a second channel in India. We just mm-hmm. had one state-run television channel. So we had video magazines that came out every month or every fortnight. It was like a, vari- it was like a variety program, you know, like a magazine. Only the magazines on video. so And, I had, and they would broadcast this on, on Friday. No, way. sell VHS tapes. Oh, sell VHS. Oh, my God. Sell VHS tapes. <laughs> so b- because people wanted to see something other than just the Doordarshan, there's, there's a state-owned television network. Right. So I had to do that as well from here. Now, how do you do that? So I'd open the yellow pages, find a cameraman there. The cameraman would come with his kit, and then we'd, we'd go around doing our interviews, doing our whatever stories, and then uh, I would put all that back in, send it by courier Onto back to India. Onto a VHS tape. No, it, well, I, I couldn't believe it because Betacam had just arrived in Australia. Oh. And the great thing about Betacam was that you could edit one or two or three generations down. Because in India at that time, we were still using the old U-Matic tapes. I don't know if anybody knows U-Matic, half-inch tapes. On low-band U-Matic, if you, if you edited three times, you went three gens down, it became black and white. <laughs> Or, or you got these <laughs> scratches coming on it. So beta cam. Well, I like, remember wow. it just with VHS editing, you'd lose so many generations just in, you know, even in one transference. Mm. So. And, and then you'd go on your VCR and put the tracking in to take all the audio disturbances away. So yeah, it was it was very different. But but doing commentary, the ABC didn't pay me because uh, I was supposed to be the visiting commentator. So, so they assumed you were being paid, paid by, by All India else. Radio, but right. All India didn't even know I was coming. <laughs> the, the good thing that happened to me, and you know, so did you just bluff them? Did you just show up and say, no, no, no. "Oh, hello, no, ABC. I'm, I'm officially I, here for duty." Reporting. I knew one name okay. in Radio Australia. His name was Brendan Telfer. I think he used to be Radio Australia, which used to come on the shortwave to India mm-hmm. back then. Yep. And a friend of mine called Sharda Ogra knew him, so I, I sent him a letter, and then he said, "We do overseas. The person to contact is Alan Marks at the ABC." So I, I faxed Alan Mark something, 
we didn't have fax at home, so you had to go walk about 200 meters to a business mm. center. You had to fly to somewhere. Brisbane, go to the Sri Lankan <laughs> hotel, and then send a fax. No, no, when, from India. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, <laughs> yeah, I know. And, and he said, send us some of your work. Luckily, my father had recorded some of my commentary on a Dulip Trophy game. So I sent that by registered post because I couldn't afford the courier. I sent that by registered post. I told him what the difference between commentary in India and Australia was, how we delivered 20-minute monologues. We didn't have chats with the experts. So please, when you listen to it, look at it from that point of view. But the ABC were just so good to me. It was incredible. Yeah. God loves a blagger, don't they? And that's essentially what you've done there. You, you found your way onto your first interview. And they put me in touch with the BBC, which was fantastic. They didn't need to. Well, I mean, but at that point, you, you, as you said, you've done a handful of test matches over a handful of years, a, yeah. a couple of domestic games. But let's go back to the very start of story you once told me about an under-19s test match in what yeah. would have been the early 80s or maybe the late 70s even, Harsha, where, where yes. you managed to find your way onto the All India Radio broadcast. Tell us that story. I know. There was an under-19 game in Hyderabad. England versus... I don't know if England was India or England was the South Zone. But one of my friends actually playing, one of my schoolmates, I just passed out of school, was playing in that game. And my father turns around and tells me, if there's an under-19 game, shouldn't there be an under-19 commentator? <laughs> How do you fight with that logic? Apart from the fact, of course, that in those days, if your father said something, you said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> my children don't understand that. <laughs> so, do I. so I changed two buses, three o'clock in the afternoon. It's blazing hot. I take one bus, go to the terminus, change another bus, go to All India Radio just before it shuts. And I think it set it up because Hyderabad is a, is a small town. Everybody is maximum one degree of separation away. I mean, small, not by world standards, small by Indian standards. So they said, uh, no, you do an audition first. Why don't you do a bit on Yovani? But a year later, I was doing Ranji Trophy commentaries there. And the, as, a, as a 20-year-old? As a 20-year-old, yes. The big advantage with starting young is you're allowed to make mistakes, you know? Right. So you make mistakes at a time when the world is charitable to you. Because if you're starting at 30, you don't have time to make mistakes. You've got to go in straight. When you're starting at 20, 21, they say he's just a kid. He's okay. And I was very lucky. I had a couple of experiences very, very early in life. The first of those in my first game, we're only doing after lunch because of uh, it's a Ranji Trophy match. Mm -hmm. And it was drinks. Now, no commercials. You've got to fill three minutes of drinks, right? So there was a senior broadcaster who'd done many years of commentary. As soon as drinks came on the ground, he quickly read the cards and said... And with that is Harsha Bhogle and walked out of the commentary box. <laughs> I've got three minutes to fill and he's already done the cards. And I remember telling myself, it's like it was yesterday. I said, one day I will be a senior commentator and I will fill this entire segment and then pass it on to the kid who's coming. But I had to survive. So, so that was one. The second was in my first year, but about a few months in, we had a makeshift commentary box which was in the middle of the crowd. They just put up a temporary stand. You, you climbed up a makeshift staircase and did commentary from there. And people were sitting 15 feet below you listening to the commentary. And if you made a mistake in choicest Hyderabadi language, they turned up, looked at you and told you what you thought of them. <laughs> so, you, so I realized then you can't be wrong. And oh, that was such a wonderful learning experience early in life. It's a pretty tough ask, though, to never be wrong. You cannot be wrong in radio unless you lie. I mean... You, you, can, you can make a little mistake here and there. You might identify a player wrong or whatever. But in the pre-television era, nobody knew if the ball was being hit on the offside or the onside. Nobody knew if the ball was seeming in or seeming out. Nobody knew if it was full or short. You just believed the radio commentator. It's amazing so, what, what uh, they can throw at you when you're broadcasting on air and suddenly that, you know, there are things that you didn't know about at all but th that you find out you know, like this, like having the, the drinks break thrown at you. I yeah. called some uh, tests on Sri Lanka Broadcasting Corporation a few years ago, did 10 minutes at the start of the day with Roshan Abbasinga, who's yes. uh, another visiting caller that a lot of ABC listeners would know. Um, and after 10 minutes, he said, all right, it's been nice chatting with you. I'll leave you with Jeff. See you later and walked out. And that was it. I was doing the rest of the test on my own. <laughs> um, you know, interchanging with the Sinhalese, five over sing Sinhalese and then me doing five overs in English. But with, we all have with our no stories. other caller. Yeah. We all have our stories, don't we? I mean, I was supposed to do the test match in, uh, in Chennai, 87, 88, India, West Indies. So I've arrived in Chennai and we had this big commentators meeting the day before, which was really a cyclostyle sheet of do's and don'ts, what you're allowed to say and what you're not allowed to say and, and, and whatever. And which is like the BBC version, yeah. of, like the list of swear words. That <laughs> but it was also, it was cyclostyle, it had been around. Does yep. anyone know what cyclostyling is? No. I don't think yeah. I do. Tell uh, us. The old cyclostyling machine where you went round and round and whatever. I, do, I don't know. It was cyclostyle. It, it, uh, it made a new copy look 10 years old. And it I was it makes more sense with the action, but the action doesn't really <laughs> come through in the audio radio. medium. <laughs> you can't see it on a <laughs> podcast. Maybe on that camera you go like that. There you <laughs> it's go. like how she's churning butter at this point. If that yes. Helps. Okay. There you go. 
or like the old ice cream machines used mm. to be the home ice cream pots. And so I was told, no, you're actually not doing all India radio. You're doing Radio Trinidad because we're supposed to do a, te- a broadcast for Radio Trinidad. That's two hours, but it's only you. I said, uh, okay, I can see there's a senior broadcaster who'd been assigned to that who didn't like it. So he sort of moved views and then asked me to do that. The only problem was in those days, India played five and a half hours of test cricket, not six. So it meant that you played 10 <laughs> minutes. There was a 20-minute tea interval and then you played one and a half hours. Oh, right. But Radio Trinidad, because they only came in with the time difference for the last two hours were on for the entire two hours. And there's a 20-minute tea break. Which you were filling on your own. So what do you do? So luckily, <laughs> uh, the, the, the West Indies manager said, I'll come down for three or four minutes and I hung on to him for dear life for 10 or 15. <laughs> and then one commentator who I'll, who I, I'll remember, I, I still, when I meet him, I say thank you to him. He said, it might be tough, come, I'll, I'll come and chat with you during the tea break. You remember those things. So I got these Oof. examinations early in life. So whatever mistakes I made, I had the opportunity to make the mistakes early in life. Not that I don't make them anymore, but you made the big ones early. Sounds like such a rich culture of cricket on the radio in India, which isn't necessarily the case now. I mean, you're the narrator of Indian cricket, as we said off the top, alongside you know, Jim Maxwell in Australia, formerly Richie Benno. Um, you, you think about uh, CMJ in the UK and, and, and Jonathan Agnew these days. And, and, and for those different nations, that they've got their, their major broadcast year in, year out. All India Radio and, and other Indian broadcasters, they've moved away from having test match commentary. What do you attribute that to? The moment television came in, All India Radio bowed and said, sir, please conquer us and take over and and just lost it. I mean, uh, what the ABC does really well and what Test Match Special does really well is not try to compete with television. Television is a monster. You cannot compete with television. But there's a lot of things television cannot do. Mm. Television cannot be warm. It cannot be intimate. It's Mm. intimidating. It cannot be intimate. Because there's these pictures, you know, the, the, the pictures that assault you almost for a broadcaster. There's these mm. pictures there. So there's a lot of things television cannot do. And what the ABC and BBC do well is they make it chatty, friendly, what a CMJ's line. Uh, you, you just, this, you assume there's people eavesdropping on, on a friendly conversation. Mm. So that, that, that's what radio does. But uh, All India Radio didn't try to do that. And they had 20 people on that panel. It was embarrassing to listen to. And luckily, I didn't have much to do with them once, once television came along. It's extraordinary, that difference between the mediums. And it's something that I find myself sometimes, even being at a match when there's a close finish, I'll sometimes leave uh, where I can see the, the field. I'll, I'll go down a stairwell or something and put the headset on and just listen to the radio call because I feel a more intimate connection sometimes with with the story of the match when I'm just hearing it and not actually being distracted by the visual of it itself. It, it's, it's a beautiful it, medium, isn't it? I mean, if... If someone asks, in all honesty, if, if you injected a broadcaster with a truth serum and said, what do you enjoy doing? Forget where your, where your livelihood comes from. Forget where the man on the street recognizes you from, because that's a big part of television, which people won't tell you about, but it's a buzz. And say, purely as, uh, as, as a journalist, what would you like to do? If anybody said television, I'd like to, I'd like to, I like to inject a truth serum, as I said. Mm. Radio is just such a beautiful medium. You're the star in radio. And we've seen that, you and I, Adam, as well, with doing radio broadcasts. When you have a, a caller who's jumping between the two, they come into the radio box and they suddenly relax. <laughs> oh, they yeah. lean back in their chair, they yeah. put their feet up and they, and they start playing shots and they start having fun and, and they, feel, they seem so much happier. Yeah, in, they're in, liberated by the medium. I mean, even last yeah. year when we were doing the Women's World Cup, jumping between the television box and the radio box, I yep. know as soon as we walked... Off the, off the TV where you had to talk to the pictures or, or not, as it were. You're limited by yeah. ad breaks at the end of every over and so forth and, and the fact that you're meant to let the pictures do the talking. Sometimes radio, you see you a little bit of cricket it. between the ad breaks. Yeah, sure. Whereas radio, your job is to, to colour in the yeah. gaps and, mm. and, and the space has got to be filled and you can, as Jeff, you say, play and, all your shots and, and eventually, bring people uh, in. Yeah, eventually, Adam, what is our sport? Why are we stopping what we're doing and doing looking at all other options, looking at cricket instead. Why do we love cricket? Because cricket's a big live play of emotion. Cricket's, cricket's just a story. It needs narrators. It needs storytellers. Cricket is a, is a giant show of emotion that's going on, but it's real. Unlike in the movies where it's scripted, the end is written first, maybe some, and then you start working the plot around that. Mm. But you know what the end is going to be. And so all the emotions are almost contrived because they are written in to suit an end. 
Whereas here, it's, it's, it's a live, real-life show of emotion. So we need time and space to tell people the story of the game. When did you make your mind up that cricket was going to be it? Because you had other academic qualifications. You'd worked yes. in finance. You came from a, a rich history or a family history of academia. Um, but you made a decision to, to shelve all of that and, and double down on cricket. H- how did you arrive at that decision? And was there any pushback from your family at the time yeah. who may have wanted you to have maybe followed in their footsteps? I, I grew up in a very happy laid-back town called Hyderabad, which in those days didn't have ambition as its middle name. So everyone was happy. I had a big break in life and I don't know how, I didn't deserve to be in there, but I got into India's number one management school. Maybe I just had an interesting CV, but I went to that management school, Adam, and I'm looking at people around me and I told myself, how on earth did I make it here? Because just the sheer academic talent around me was huge. But salaries in those days were very low. I, I, I got a starting, I got a job in advertising. I'd been working for three or four years. And luckily, my wife was working and she had a flat in Bombay. If you got a flat in Bombay, you kidnap a girl. <laughs> she was, luckily, we, we, so I just got married, packed my bag and moved in. <laughs> so, and, our, and most important, we weren't in love with money. Our, uh, our needs were small. So in those days, we used to say, it's income minus saving equal to expenditure. So you had to save because you didn't know what tomorrow brought for you. So saving was mandatory. Unlike today where it's income minus expenditure, there's anything left that's saving, isn't it? Because people live beyond their means. So we learned to live within our means. And so I was able to take a chance because my wife was working. Our expenses were low. And it wasn't that I got up one morning at a eureka moment saying, I'm going to go. One of the big joys of graduating out of the premier management school is, you know, if it doesn't work out, you can go back to advertising and get mm. a job again. That was a, that was a huge relief. So, and then one thing just led to the other and... And then TV came, Harsha. I mean, we know you as a radio yeah. voice in Australia. You're doing Fox Sports at the moment, but primarily the way that, well, certainly Jeff and I have got to know you has been the ABC's visiting caller, yes. that intimacy we talked about before about um, over, over successive tours. We, we knew who Harsha Bogle was. We knew the way you told a story and so on. And it's a long relationship. You it know, is. It goes back a long way for us. I mean, us. I feel yeah. like I've known does, you. Does TV build relationships with, with people? I'm not sure whether it does. I mean, I think the four on nine did. The four on nine did in their yeah, pomp. Yeah. yeah. But, but, but radio's purpose-built for it. So even yes. though you and I have known each other for a couple of years, Harsha, I feel like I've known you for 20 years. True. Hmm. There's, that, that, there's that difference there. But you did go to TV, and that's where you made your name and made your celebrity. I mean, you're rocking around with over 8 million Twitter followers, which is, is a blunt measure, but illustrative look, of what TV can do. In the, look, and, let's and, look at it as a percentage of population. <laughs> yeah, maybe so, but yeah. you, 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 that, that sure. TV life you've led, that, that's a... What's it like being a celebrity? I mean, you've gone from being a cricket know. freelancer, developing photos in your bathroom, yeah. you know, talking about <laughs> writing two newspaper reports and blagging your way yeah. onto radio. That's one thing. That's one thing that Jeff and, and I Now he's got other people with. trying to take photos with him in yeah, the bathroom. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> but what, what, no. what number of, have, The number of selfie requests. Precisely. But what we'll never identify with probably is that is that celebrity. Like, What's it like yeah. with people view you that way and the, the adoration that you have in India especially? It makes you feel very humble, to be honest, because I often tell myself, why on earth? It's just me, you know? It's just me. So I've often told people, why? I mean, it's, it's just me, right? And I still haven't come to terms with the fact that people want to come and take selfies with you. When we do our corporate talks, it often takes about 20, 25 minutes to leave the hall because everybody wants a selfie. You go to a place like Indoor, for example, you can't get out of the, uh, of the uh, airport because everybody wants a selfie. And especially the cricketers aren't around, then they make do with what's next best, right? So, <laughs> so you're not the star, but you're the next best. So it's all right. I've got, I've got somebody. But you cannot let that get to you. I, I've, I've seen a lot of people who got recognized and who started to play to that image. And then suddenly, well, next time you meet them, they're different people. Mm. I think you must have support systems around you when you start to get famous, where there's people telling you you're going wrong. I, mean, I remember Anita telling me one day, she said, by the way, you were a bit rude to that man. And I said, oops. Sorry, I didn't realize it. But she will tell me at all times, she's, she's my, as I say, she's my anchor and she's my wings. She's, she's both. But uh, you must have someone around you. So I keep telling a lot of these kids as well. I remember telling Rahul Dravid once when he was just coming up. I said, whatever you do, don't marry a fan. Because you must have somebody at home who's setting the balance right. I don't know how it works with these young kids who don't want to hear anything said against them. And the moment someone says something against them, they say, there, he's villain. No, you need someone to have these checks and balances. So you cannot, you, it, it opens a lot of doors for you, I must tell you. It opens a lot of doors for you. It gets you upgrades on flights sometimes. It gets you good hotel rooms. It, it, does, it does a lot for you, but you've got to be aware that it's, 
it's fleeting. It's not there tomorrow. And in some fundamental sense, it's, it's, in a way, it's a denial of your identity as an actual person because, you know, someone who doesn't know you is, is talking to you as though they do or they're recognising yeah. you as, as something. They have a relationship with you, but it's a one-way relationship. Yes. And, and they have a relationship with an image or an idea of you that's not the actual person. I imagine that must be, yeah. you know, in an existential is, sense, yeah. quite confusing. The only issue is everybody wants a little piece of you. So I, I mean... I can imagine what it must be like being a Tendulkar or a Dravid because everybody, everywhere you go wants a piece of you mm. and you actually want some days to say, you know what, can I go somewhere where I will not talk cricket? Yep. But, but can you imagine if you met uh, a movie star or, or you met someone who was in the movie industry, you would want to talk to them about movies, wouldn't of you? Course. Because, so everyone wants to talk cricket to you and we are, we are a country that's obsessed, that's obsessed mm. with cricket. So I find refuge in my classmates from my management school who knew me before I'd done television so to them, he's just this guy who used to walk around in a in a towel in a in a hostel, <laughs> yeah. And You'll I find to speak up. <laughs> yeah, I find refuge in that. So yeah, I'm interested in, in your relationship with Australia because you know, as as Adam and I said, we've we've been hearing you for for decades coming out here, and you're you're very. I like the way you said decades. It suddenly makes me feel older. Well, <laughs> it, you know, we, we could say sagacious, um, <laughs> eminent. They're mm. much nicer. They're all, they're all different ways of saying the same thing. They are. Um, yeah. They're all they're all euphemistic. But you do have you're you're very well loved here. It's, it's interesting to me that um, you know plastered. Australian cricket fans on the way out of the ground will they know who you are and they want to come and talk to you you know you've managed to establish this relationship with with Australia and with Australia often often they they know me by voice mm. not by face right so the, a couple of tours ago we were just outside Melbourne on the way to that on, on the Great Ocean Road somewhere we'd stopped mm. somewhere and I went and bought an ice cream there four or five of us I went and bought an ice cream and I said can I have some ice cream and he just looked up to me and said you I said yes he said I know that voice <laughs> So people know me know me by because I, an Indian accent. Let's face it, an Indian accent was very very rare on the Australian radio waves yeah. when I came. There was Vijay Chakrapani till the sixties, but and then he moved. He, he settled down in Australia, but otherwise an Indian accent was rare. So I was a curiosity, right. saying who's this guy with an Indian accent? Because the feeling was Indians don't speak English. So I'd actually I'd get people stopping me and saying, "Did you learn your English in England?" I said, "No, I never went abroad till I was twenty seven, twenty eight. Mm. So it's uh, <laughs> we we speak English in India." You speak this, so, but but what I liked about Australia more than anything else was was the egalitarianism in Australian society. I mean, you can anyone could come up and have a chat with you. I like the openness, and I like the fact that you could disagree and be friends. It's very important to me that you disagree and be friends. As 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 a kid, my father had made me read a lot of French because my father taught French, so I studied French as a kid, and. He, he told me the lines from Voltaire. He said, I may never agree with you, but I will fight to the death for your right to say what you want mm. to. And as a, as a kid, I was saying, I said, yeah, what a great way to live. And when I came to Australia, I saw that happening, that you were allowed to have a point of view and it was okay. You could still have a drink at the end of the day. Yeah, you said it to me before that you like you the robust nature yeah. of the Australian back and forth on radio or on television. That David Hooks taught me that. Yeah. David Hooks taught me that many years ago. Mm -hmm. He said, a Aussie will come hard at you, mate. He said, whether it's on the cricket ground or in the commentary box, an Aussie will come hard at you. But if you stand up to your point of view, he'll respect you. If you buckle under, he, he won't care too much for you. Right. Harsha, in, in 2016, you, you stood up for yourself. It was a, a challenging year for you. Yes. You became a massive target, which is almost a flow on from what we talked about with your celebrity. I mean, you'd worked in the IPL in season one for the Mumbai Indians, but then you became kind of the, the narrator of it, the voice of it through the commentary. And then a perception that you were, quote, a biased commentator um, was, was the end of your time working as the, the, the TV commentator on that particular broadcast. Um, that must have been galling, uh, having your integrity brought into question, question in such a pronounced way. Uh, how, how did you deal with that process and how did you kind of bounce back so quickly? I tried to explain to people that there is a difference between a biased commentary and an India-centric commentary. I was doing the World T20. Yep. The World T20 was going, the, the world feed was going all over the world. It was an India-Bangladesh game. So there were people in Bangladesh just as passionate as us in India mm. listening into the telecast. I cannot mount an India-centric telecast when it's going to Bangladesh and Pakistan and everywhere. If I'm doing a Hindi telecast that's only going to India, and we all do Hindi commentary as well, you can be India-centric, but at no point should you ever be allowed to be biased. So I tried to explain to people that you have to present both points of view. But uh, we're going through a phase which is a slightly dangerous phase in broadcasting all around the world where broadcasters are expected to stand up for the country they come from. Mm. And I found that very difficult to come to terms with. 
but luckily there's 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 a lot of us who still who still think that way but uh, i hope the day doesn't come when you're expected to be a cheerleader for your side and it's not just india is it do you remember those images from the 2015 ashes of, i think yeah. it was mark taylor and ian healy wearing I, the team yeah, kit I, i remember an article were, about i remember an article about channel 9 <laughs> and the mateiness <laughs> Yeah. So the mightiest mate to ever mate it, if memory serves me correctly, was a defining line from that piece of writing to the man to my right. The last, a, last of the mated seems, seems un- unlikely, but uh, anyway. It, it's, yeah. uh, it didn't, didn't win me a lot of friends in some courses. <laughs> it so, doesn't. But, but I, I remember reading that. And I think we might have met there in Brisbane over, over a little lunch. And suddenly everyone yeah. said, who's, who's this Jeff Lemon? You know, who's taken on <laughs> Channel 9. But I like the fact that you can do that and still have a broadcasting home in this country. So, you, you so were you under pressure when you did that? Um, Sorry. Um, I, th- I think it was. I, I was I was being looked at sideways by by colleagues who were saying, um, you know, it's good that you wrote that, but but the the subtext was we're keen to see what happens next. Yes. You know, we, we want to see what happens because you've stepped out of line. You're, you're not supposed to criticize other people who work yeah. in your industry. But I, I've tended to feel that if I can't be honest and, and give an honest opinion on something, I shouldn't be here. I shouldn't be yeah. working here. So, so I was I was told, for example, what six days before the start of the World Cup, before the start of the IPL, my bookings are done, everything's done, saying sorry, but we can't have you. this year mm. and and that's it just as abruptly no, as no more no yeah. other 2016 and you know what it turned out to be a big advance big move for me in my career in my career because all of a sudden this word went around or oh, I, i made a couple of mistakes there though i retweeted two tweets that i should not have retweeted one of them if those said, are the worst of your mistakes yeah. <laughs> at the end of no your life, no but... one of them said it's 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 like a pizza without the cheese and toppings on it listening to the broadcast without you is like a pizza without the cheese mm. and toppings on it and i was going through a phase that i'd regret now i was angry for a couple of months you should never ever be angry in life but that's tough to do you shouldn't be angry on the internet at least so well i only retweeted two yeah. that's all i did mm. and i wrote a, a facebook post that just went viral everywhere saying i do not know why i've been asked this but i still have a home in star i'm still happy and whatever whatever that home in star was soon to vanish Uh, as as a result of, of of all that happened and suddenly the new stickers were on talking about it there were chat shows where this was being brought up there was pranay roy the father of indian news television asking sharuk khan on a program saying what do you think why is he not there and mm-hmm. sharuk khan is saying oh we like him as a broadcaster he must be there what it did to me without me realizing is what it suddenly raised my profile in india where i could <laughs> never have taken it and then these kids kids came in i promise you they were kids they're as old as my as my older son these kids came in and said we're running this website called crick buzz and sir will you everyone sir right right, right. so will you And I remember telling Anita, I said, you know, all our life, that's what we've done. We said, let's give it a go. What's the worst thing that will happen? It won't work, right? And in our first year, we did 200 million video views. And I told them, I don't mind if it's 12. But if it's 12, tell me it's 12. Because if you tell me it's a million and it's 30,000, I'll, I'll, I won't like it. And they said, no, these are verifiable by Google. And suddenly we discovered that there is a three, four minute video storytelling platform that was, that was waiting to be discovered. So I suddenly made a, made a connect with younger, younger people. Yeah, so you've expanded your audience, but that, that kind of speaks to your perennial freelancer nature, yeah, doesn't yeah, it? You, you saw an opportunity and you didn't necessarily know whether it would be successful. You backed in these young blokes who've gone on and created this beast. Which, yeah, you know, I mean, uh, people can shut doors on you, but as I keep telling people, the breeze flows in through the windows. Does that, does that must be, keep you young and youthful as well. Like you say, you've developed a, a new base of people that, that follow your videos at Stumps each night yeah. and throughout your, your, uh, your, your yeah. travelling the world with the Indian cricket team. It, it must be gratifying having this... whole new group of people who maybe aren't following the cricket in traditional means or listening to you on the wireless or watching on television who now understand uh, your, your take on the game. Digital is the most beautiful thing that's happened to sport because it's taken all the goalkeepers away. You know, when we were kids, mm. uh, well, the gatekeepers away, really. When we were kids, there was a, there was a cruel sub-editor there. Yep. Your article never got past the sub-editor. And then there was a television producer, well-meaning, but the television producer who had to cater to his television his television needs he needed the big names whatever whatever so there was always a gatekeeper between you and the and the average punter following following the game television uh, digital has taken that away now suddenly you reach him directly and if he likes you he follows you if he doesn't like you or she doesn't like you she doesn't follow you anymore so and as two of you have realized as well suddenly it opens up pathways that you never thought were possible it allows free speech it allows it's it's fantastic what digital has done and a related comment that you made that I found very interesting was uh, the need to be versatile when yes. if you're freelancing you have to be able you to do no everything yeah 
Yeah, you have absolutely no choice. You have to be, in, in the days gone by, you had to be able to write an 800-word article, a 3,000-word article, a 45-second piece for the BBC, a whole day broadcast, a telecast. If you got to be the front man, as I did, without knowing at all what a front man required, I did my first telecast as a live front man. That was the first time I'd won a earpiece in my life. <laughs> I had no clue what a live telecast entailed. A director in your ear telling you what to do. Never heard that. Didn't even know yep. that that was what it was. Yeah. Sometimes it's good, you know, because you don't go in with preconceived ideas of failure. It's we, daunting when you get it wrong, I well, assure yeah. you. <laughs> but we had, Adam and I had exactly yeah. that same experience at yeah. Women's World Cup last year. I don't think either of us had done television commentary. You pop that earpiece in and suddenly there are not just a director, but six. So there's a guy in the truck yeah. and there are cameramen and there are eight people talking while you're trying to commentate. Yeah. No one had told me that this was a thing that happened. I'd done radio, but not TV. But you were doing commentary. You're not, you're not doing a piece to camera, were you? Yeah. Now, if you're, doing, if you're doing commentary, you can still squint your eyes a little bit and whatever and strain hard to listen and still talk but you can't do that if the camera's on you right. so the camera's on you you've got this beautiful you know this beatific smile on your face <laughs> and there's actually all kinds of things going on so you know in the, in the, in the yeah. early days even now at the end of a day waist downwards my legs would pain because waist upwards you've got to look like you're enjoying life but it's like the, it's like the duck you're paddling furiously beneath mm. so my legs would be digging in to the ground because I was, I was tense but I couldn't look tense so I'm smiling but I'm actually very tense so my legs would hurt at the end of the day and I'd not walked half it's, a kilometre it's, it's kind of a great metaphor for you know the, the turmoil that goes on in people's heads where they're yeah. smiling blithely outside and have voices in their head on the inside there's a, yeah. a lot of us who feel like that I think. And, I, and I didn't know what shirt where to go with what jacket with what tie i'd just been this casual informal fellow who only ever had one jacket in life and suddenly i'm expected to wear a jacket and tie i did not know how to knot a tie i quickly found a cameraman who did and so <laughs> every day i'd come and give my tie to the cameraman lawrence yancy van rensberg from south africa and he would knot a double knot for me because the first day i went i i, I put my little rat tail knot and yanked it and went there and he said that's no data or what i mean i'm not good at south african accent. <laughs> so i had to learn everything from scratch and so I was, you've got to be humble otherwise you don't get far a few months ago we had a chat you, you, your view was that the day of the non-playing television broadcaster might have come to an end i think that the, the quote was there'll never be anyone else like me and that wasn't a pumping your own tires up that was a it was almost a, a, a lament a, a lament at the industry yeah. and how it had evolved uh, but we've seen on channel seven last week um yeah. Alison mitchell and tim lane the, the primary two callers yeah. Uh, and of course, you're doing Fox Sports at the moment, albeit as the guest commentator. But yeah, all the same, there's yeah, with Isha and Mark Howard. So, yeah, but Isha's yeah, a former, Isha former player, former player, player famous, Mark yeah. Howard. So, I mean, maybe the maybe but, there but has still been... to have a female lead, you know, anchoring a, a, a men's test broadcast is you know, it's unusual. something very interesting. The yeah. other day, Neroli Meadows told me she said she was in tears when Isha was calling Pujara's hundred. I said, why? She said, I never thought a day would come in Australia when a woman would be calling calling something like this, yeah. and I, I'd be part of a telecast. So, I mean, I think I've always believed you need a storyteller and an expert. The storyteller, the, the narrator, the baller ball man cannot pretend to be the expert mm. because then he loses his standing. Mm. You're gone. You can't do that anymore. Because the moment you say, where's that elbow going? Is the head in line? Where's that going? Where's that going? Sorry. People will ask you, how do you know? You, you didn't play test cricket. You didn't. The, the quintessential criticism of a commentator, right? Oh, you didn't play professional cricket. How could you possibly know? You, you still get that. Oh, I get that every day. I, 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 I get that every day. But my role is different. And I realized early in life, I said, can I be the non-striker? When I used to play cricket for my university side, I found I was in partnerships where I was making 25, 30% of the runs, but I was in long partnerships. And I said, can I be the non-striker? It's, it's a lovely thought that, that all of us can go through. It, it struck me. Can I be the non-striker? I'll, I'll rotate the strike around. Every time I'm on strike, I'll get off because it's by getting off that I get the lead player in. Mm. And I found that worked for me, but it requires you to be very aware of what you cannot do, which is sometimes as important in life as knowing what you can do. And so it, and, and so it worked. It's, it started to work well for me. But I think there must always be a caller and a summarizer, a storyteller and an expert. You can have the batting average of 55 to tell people what should happen, what shouldn't happen. But hang on. 
what is the emotion of a guy who's walking out on his first test? His, his, his parents are in tears over there. He's waited 25 years for this moment and he nicks the first ball. How is he feeling? You've got, someone's got to be able to tell that story because the people in, in, in houses want to hear stories. That's what our game is about. It's about emotion. Yeah, and which isn't to say that's, that some former players can't do it. If but, they can, that's great. But the idea that just because you've played that sport, you can just be thrown into the commentary box and can, can helm a broadcast, lead a broadcast and, and uh, be skilled enough to do that is it's, yeah. it's very some close can. minded yeah some can and if they can do it they have a huge advantage over mm. people like the three but it still us. takes work you know it's it's yeah. still not something you just walk out of your career and, and walk into doing the person with a batting average of 50 when he retires from international cricket has to forget that he has a batting average of 50 and treat this career with the same rigor mm. with which he treated his career as as a batsman mm. or bowler and, and that's, a, that's that, what we see very infrequently yeah i was going to say how, how, how often do you find that harsh i mean you've worked with a lot of former greats who still do um, is it more often than not they do take that attitude or is it most of the time no, some do some some do uh, my template for work ethic is always Ian Chappell it's, it's just my template for work ethic mm. I've, I've seen a young producer go up to Ian Chappell almost scared this great man in front and saying oh, uh, Chappelle there's a problem would you mind doing an extra stint and he's busy doing his little newspaper report and he slams a laptop down and says sure mate up he goes and does it. Mm. I remember one day in Bristol, it was so hot because the studio was all black. It was hot. And I said three or four times, I said, ah, oh, as you can see, it's very hot in here. And as soon as it was done, we came out, nice, fresh air. I get this tap on the back and said, mate, would you mind if I said something to you? I said, Chappelle, you, me, you got a right. You can say what you want. He said, if Kerry Packer was listening to that, he would have been on the phone just now saying, I'm not paying you to tell people how uncomfortable you are. I'm paying people, I'm paying you to tell people what the story of the match is if it's zero degrees mate it's zero degrees if it's 45 degrees it's 45 degrees it's too bad mm. you're being paid to tell the story of the game not to tell people how uncomfortable you are yeah like you're yeah. you're not the story yeah. i said thank you very much Chappelle. Mm. i'll remember that forever that's interesting and it's a great line that you're not the story when i was doing that facebook post i said at the end of it all i said i'm getting more attention than i'm comfortable with but i am not the story i'm only the teller of the story mm. We are not the story. Kerry O'Keefe is the one who, who um, occurs to me as being the most prepared commentator I think I've ever heard in terms it's a cricket of... cricket tragic. But, but the depth of, of research and preparation that he would do and, and would bring into the box. Kerry, I, I keep telling Kerry, if there was an under eights game being played between Nauru and Fiji, you'd watch it and find a conclusion because he will watch <laughs> it. He's, he's just a fabulous old-fashioned cricket lover. But... I, f- I fear he's getting tight as this teller of jokes in the comic. Mm. He's not. He is at heart an outstanding summarizer who follows the game very well, works his backside off. You must see the notes. I mean, he, he writes, his, his alphabets are about, uh, his, the letters he writes are about half an inch big. So he only writes that much on a page. But he is easily the most prepared Broadcaster. Well, you see it at the back of the press box when he's finished his commentary stint, he comes into the press box, which isn't common for a broadcaster to mm. do that. Sits at the back, watches the coverage, and, and continues adding to yeah. his huge wad of notes. It's, uh, I met it's a an admirable of, quality. I met a lot of broadcasters who just turn up, don't want to see the rundown. They just turn up, and it's my job to keep the rundown going, but they haven't seen the rundown, so they don't know what's coming next. So they're just waffling along, and it's my job to rein them in, quickly bring them back. Or the, and these days, one of the problems is we don't have commentary is no longer produced because the producer is so much in awe of the player who's doing commentary. And I've, I've actually heard a couple of people say, how dare you tell me that? You're only the producer. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the, 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 the balance has shifted, has shifted completely. To what extent do you want to stay in cricket, Harsha, really long term? I mean, I know you've had such a rich career in the sport, but yeah. um, you've, you've done many other things. Now you're in the corporate world, been speaking. You've written books that are both about cricket and not about cricket. Is there a temptation to spend more time at home yes. rather than continually being on the beat full time and being around the world for gently. eight or nine months a year or whatever it is? Yeah, you're gently saying that maybe I might be getting on. In <laughs> no, I'm not. I would never say such a thing. Oh. No, but, uh, but it's interesting. I, I love doing cricket matches in England. Yep. And I just, I would never give up the opportunity of coming to Australia. But I found this year when Sony said, we'll do India versus South Africa out of Mumbai. And a part of me said, yeah, that's okay. I did tours of West Indies last year and in Sri Lanka. I spent a lot of time just for six one days in West Indies and a series in Sri Lanka. And I found there were days when I was getting out of bed and I was not bounding out of bed and saying another great opportunity, another day's cricket. I'm thinking of other things. So... Mm. 
uh, it does get it does get uh, it does get more difficult also because as you grow older you become more rigid and more set in your ways you want things to be a certain way because you've got used to that happening when you were a kid if you if if you, if you got a bed or you could just got a mattress on the ground you slept on that and mm. you were grateful for being able to do cricket the next day that that changes a little bit so i uh, yeah I, also if i don't do a series like i didn't do the home series against the west indies i opted not to do it because i didn't want to burn myself out i didn't want cricket to be a drudgery because cricket's been mm. my life so uh, that that's starting to happen i i will do less i think as i go along i fear in terms of the changing mediums the online stuff you're doing so on does that help keep a little bit of that interest given that there are new and different ways to go about doing and and there things? are there's so many wonderful young people coming into our profession I mean some of the finest insights I get are from social media. There's just this kid sitting somewhere in a small town in India will point out something and says, "Oh, but actually, you know, he has got out three times like this and whatever, but you did not mention that." And I say, "Oh, yeah, I didn't strike." Me. <laughs> There's some intense uh, amidst all the all the toxicity and hatred on social media. There's some genuine cricket lovers will come up with things. So, uh I and I think they should all be allowed a voice. They should all be allowed a voice. They should be I mean, cricket commentary has to get revolutionized. You need to have four audio channels. The pictures are the same. There's four different audio feeds going out, so to each his own. And, and it feels and like one of them without any commentary. I right, mean, big one, thing. One of them, no commentary at all. Just the sounds of the game. The stump mic is on. The scratching of the guard is on. The ball hits the bat. Mm. All the sounds of the game are on, but no commentary at all. They're so so evocative. Those sounds, you yeah. Know, the spikes, the little bit of chat. The yeah. But there's a reason I want that. Because I want when people listen to me on a broadcast to have chosen to listen to me rather than <laughs> have no choice and be stuck with me. Yeah, and it was something yeah. that that would come up a lot in the criticism of the broadcasters here. That you know they would say, "Well, our ratings are you know X million, so people must like the broadcast." And you'd say, "Well, it, they, they're they captives; they don't have a choice. If Correct. they want to watch the cricket, they have to. There's yeah. no way to distinguish who hates it and who loves it." You must. Why not? Why not a nerdy commentary where after every ball, someone's pulling out stats like a cricket quiz commentary? Mm. Yeah, well, I mean, in many respects, when when we first started doing alternative cricket commentary some yeah. years ago, Jeff and I, th- th- there was there was a degree of that. Um, it, it was wanting to almost be like a red button option in a pay yeah. television context, where people can hear a different version of of, of that game that they've grown mm. accustomed to for many years. When we did the did the work in the UAE earlier this year, we we tried to almost combine the two. It was quite nerdy, but also we. Wanted How did that to, go? How did that go? Did, was was it well received? The uh, the broadcast on the UAE. We, we, I think we I think it was uh, certainly yeah. the, the feedback we received from people. Um, uh, who listened in were, were, were glad that we provided the service and I think we were able to strike the right note, especially that draw in Dubai. The, the well, we, we got lucky and, with we an did, incredible yeah. test match. So, we, you know, the first one we did was one of the great finishes. You're always lucky when you do cricket. Of course. But, yeah, I mean, so but in cool. terms of the quality, to come down to the last over on the yeah, last true. day and have, you know, see one of the great innings ever played by an Australian from Usman Khawaja, it was, you know, we, we couldn't have, have struck and How better. good is it? For years, a player called Usman Khawaja would never have been able to play cricket for Australia. Yep. Isn't that Absolutely. fantastic? I see so much of that in Australia. I see that as a big change in Australia from when I used when I first came. It's so much more multicultural. There's there's a kid called Jason Sanga who's coming through the ranks, isn't he, from New South Wales? Uh, there's yeah, there's Gurinder Sandhu who's played cricket for for uh, for New South Wales. Yeah, we finally yeah. got you know a good half dozen Indigenous players yeah, at the top level. Fantastic, um, you know, playing in the T20 sides, the one day sides. All you need now is, uh, is go into Afghanistan and and bring about ten leg spinners from there. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm sure that'll be the next plan. In their They're growing on trees projects there. and so on. With They're growing on trees in Afghanistan. They're cranking them out. They've just got the production line going. It, it's almost yeah. interesting that the time you've been coming to Australia, many people would argue that um, we become a less tolerant country. At, at, at the top end in terms of the way we've uh, policy settings have been and so forth. But your experience as someone in cricket is that Australia's become yeah. a more inclusive and open country. It is, but, but Adam, I don't know if I'm, if I'm representative because I see only a part of Australia. Because I don't work here, I don't understand workplace politics. Mm-hmm. If, everyone told me when I first came, Australia's a racist country. And I go back and say, I've never once seen racism. Mm. And they say, but you, you, you haven't worked there. Maybe there is an undercurrent somewhere. And I said, I'm lucky not to have seen it. Because yep. I work in the media. So I do not know if my comments are valid for the greater Australia because I only see a small, very convenient, comfortable part of life in this country. And you're also already liked. You know, you're, you're someone Maybe, that people have yeah. decided that they like ahead of time. So there is an issue, you know, almost any racist in Australia will have some friends who are not white, but yeah. they think those ones, oh, they're fine. That guy's fine because I know him. It's just all the other ones who I don't know. <laughs> what, 
the, but, you know, that's, that's but the world is heading towards becoming more territorial. Where everyone's, whether it's through Brexit or the US or right wing in India, where everyone's trying to hang on to their mm. territories. So I don't know where the world's going to be after I'm gone. You've got an election in India next year, which could yeah. mean the IPL is moved. I know. For those who are listening in Australia and aren't overly familiar with the Indian political situation, why is it so robust or why is it so uh, volatile, rather, that it could end up in a situation where something like a domestic cricket tournament would need to be moved? Listen, the elections in India are the world's largest democratic process by a long margin. And we have these electronic voting machines. Every single vote. There's no ballot paper in India anymore, by the way. It's all on electronic voting machines. But you require security. And the whole state machinery is geared to providing security at election booths. And so you cannot have an IPL going on at that time only because the state cannot provide security. And, you know, we have, our part of the world is, is a very violent, turbulent part of the world. You know, I mean, I, uh, to our east, there's trouble. There was trouble in Bangladesh at one point. There was a lot of trouble in Sri Lanka at one point. To our west, there's all kinds of things happening in, in Pakistan and Afghanistan and beyond. Who's... If, who's to know where the next terrorist attack is going to be? India's been, India's had some terrible terrorist attacks over the years. So you have to have a lot of security around around IPL cricket matches. So the elections are on, you can't have the IPL mm. on at the same time. Can't you just have people vote at the cricket? Just come to the stadium, <laughs> watch the game, vote. 1.3 billion, you, yeah. you know, when you suddenly realise 1.3 billion and not 25 million, you just say, ah, oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I like, I, but I like the system in Australia where voting is is mandatory. You have to vote. Mandatory and also preferential voting. The, the two yeah. things that we've given the world. Not everyone have taken them. India, up. we have a nota option. None of the above. Mm. Oh, you, really? can, you can actually go yeah. and vote. You can say I don't like any of the candidates. Nota. Well, you, you I'm waiting for nota to win an election. You can do that in Australia, but you do it by drawing a dick on your ballot paper. That, that's <laughs> that's the time on it. And we would never <laughs> use that word ever on even on a podcast <laughs> in India. How, how, how cool is that? <laughs> Yeah. Well, sir, we, we, uh, I, I am very aware of how busy you are, and as a consequence, I know no, at some point yeah. we probably. I'm not probably as the busy right as time. you are, Adam. The two of you, <laughs> I have no idea how much you do. I'm nowhere near as busy as the two of you. No, yeah. but it has been an absolute joy to work yeah. with you, and our continued continue chance to do so. Thank you so much for coming on the yeah. Christmas special of the Final Word. Hopefully, as people have driven down to rural Australia or to their family's place on Christmas morning, they've, they've chucked you on and thought, gee, I can't wait to hear him on Boxing Day. That, that's certainly the. Certainly, the uh, the impression. Nah, I, just, I, I just hope Australia remains as kind to me. Australia has been ridiculously kind to me. I've never understood why, but that's why this emotional bond with this country. Well, it's a relationship that that goes both ways. A lot of affection in both directions. So, thank you for everything over the Pleasure, years. Yeah.